Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Ann McDonough, Deputy Director here at the DC History Center, and we are thrilled to be hosting today's Researching Family History Orientation. If you're not familiar with us, the DC History Center is a nonprofit, community supported educational and research organization founded in 1894. We collect and share the local history of our nation's capital. Our mission is to deepen understanding of our city's past to connect, empower, and inspire. And we do this work through research and scholarship, youth education, adult programs like this one, and exhibits. Our building is located in the historic Carnegie Library at Mount Vernon Square, and you'll always find us online at dchistory.org and on social media. We're happy today to have our outstanding program partner, Stephen Hammond, with us. You're gonna learn much more about him and his family shortly. So I'll just take a moment to say that Stephen is an exemplary family researcher and program partner who is generously sharing his knowledge with us today. We're very lucky <laughs> to have been connected uh, by Linda Critchlow White, who presented a family history research orientation with us earlier this year and who sits on our community council. Linda is also joining us today in a moderation role. During the program, Linda will be responding to questions via the Q&A and encouraging discussion among all of you participating. At the end, she'll also join Steve on screen to answer some of your questions. This program includes an opportunity not only to learn from us as your guides to family history, but to learn from each other. So please use the Q&A to chat with, our with your fellow attendees. You can like and respond to messages. Um, the chat channel is gonna be restricted simply so that we can have one place to send you resources and information but we do hope you'll send messages, questions, and comments to and from other per program participants via the Q&A. You'll find both of those options located at the bottom of your Zoom window. All the resources we send today can be found in the DC History Center LibGuide, which we'll go over later in the program. So if you lose track of the resources, don't fear. They'll all be conveniently located in one place. So let's get that conversation going by sharing your experience with researching your family history. Tell us in the Q&A what brought you to this program and where you are in your research journey. Let us know where you're joining us from. Again, please use the Q&A channel to share your experience and comment in response to others. As an overview of today's program, most of the hour will be spent on Stephen's presentation on getting started with family research and tips to know. And then he'll take a brief look at some collections materials that were helpful in his research here in the Kiplinger Research Library. I'll briefly introduce you to our research guide before directing some of your questions to Steve and to Linda. We're gonna do all of that in just one hour. <laughs> so on that note, let's get started. So Steve, the mic is yours. Thank you, Anne. Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here. We have a lot to cover. So let's see if we can't get this going. I see this uh, presentation here as a smorgasbord to share with you some of the things that I have learned and products that I've used and that kind of thing. So I'm hoping that you find this useful and uh, we're gonna move relatively quickly as we go through this space. There we go. So here's what you can expect today. Uh, the, the material that I have to share with you today is, is geared towards the beginner, but there's something here for everybody. So I hope all of you get something out of this and I would, I would love to hear uh, what you think in the chat. Uh, we're, as I said, we're going to move relatively quickly. The goal here isn't to focus and do a deep dive in each of these documents, but to whet your appetite so that you can think about the kinds of things that will help you. Um, I'll provide some suggestions for documents that can help you get started and some ways for you to think about how to get rolling on your family history. I'll buy, provide some examples and things that I've discovered, and perhaps they'll help you along the way, and then we'll get into the Q&A. But there's breaking news. Here's something that I wanted to share with you before we even get started. One of the things that my um, fellow descendants and I have been working on over at the Arlington House is to change the name of that site from the Arlington House Robert E. Lee Memorial. Uh, and just on Thursday, Congressman Don Beyer and Senator Tom Kane introduced a bicameral legislation bill to the Congress to change the name from Arlington House Robert Lee Memorial to Arlington House National Historic Site. So we as descendants are extremely excited about this in terms of being able to tell more stories and think about our research and our, and our country's history differently. So more about that if you have questions later on. Here are some of the documents that you're gonna to see today. It's a whole list of things. As I said, we're gonna to have to move pretty quickly to see everything here. The items that are in red are the items that we'll kind of talk about afterwards that you'll see here in the library. 
why did I start my research? And I think this is really important. I like to talk about this just for a few minutes as I uh, you know, kind of help people to see where I'm coming from. My goal is to seek truth and clarity. I'm primarily trying to figure out the folklore, the fiction, and the facts that I have been uh, made aware of. You know, there, there are things there that my um, uh, cousins and ancestors have taught me about our family history. And a lot of times they conflict with the facts that exist out there. And sometimes it's fiction and sometimes it is in fact fact. Uh, I wanna honor and remember my family members. I wanna expand my own personal knowledge, but I also wanna educate folks like yourselves and inspire you to think about how you go about your own research. And I wanna share my family narrative, which is, I think is really important. So where do you start in a, in a journey like this? Well, here's a list of things that you, you should think about. And, and the key here for me is start with what you know. There are things that you know about your family, like maybe when your mom or your brother and sister were born or when they were married, but there were, then there are also things that you know that you don't know, like, you know, where were they when they were 21 years old or, you know, to be able to ask questions like that. And then there's this large concept, which is there are a lot of things out there that we don't know that we don't know. And my whole goal is to go from what I know to try to enlarge that bubble so that it overlaps with all the things that we don't know that we don't know today. So the important thing here are don't assume anything. And I think most importantly is have fun. Don't get overwhelmed and to keep it simple. So, hey, we might as well start in the library here. I wanted to share a couple of pictures uh, with you that I took or were taken of me just a couple of weeks ago as I was looking at uh, documents preparing for this presentation. And we'll talk about some of these in just a few minutes. But there's a lot of material here that I hope will entice you to come in and become familiar with the resources they have here. So where do you start in terms of your, your, your genealogy and how do you do it? Well, here's one example. And I put this up here simply as an example. There are other examples out there, but you can go and do a, a web search, a Google search. And in this particular case, I pulled up what's on legacytree.com. And the way they go about suggesting research is identify known information. This is what, know what you know, plan the research, search for the records, analyze those records, and then make some conclusions. So there's a, a pretty simple five-step process that you could use that can get you down the road to get started. So I wanted to share with you, kind of as, as I orient you with my own family, I'm going to try to overlay some of the information about my own family on the documents that we've talked about. So I wanted to start with this particular graphic that shows you the challenges that we all have as we're thinking about trying to identify our ancestors. If you look at this, this uh, graphic here, you can see the black box in the center, that's me. And above that it are all of my ancestors. This goes back six generations. And by the time we add all of those uh, um, ancestors up, we have about 126 ancestors. In my ancestry database, I have about 4,575 4, individuals. The number of individuals I found in my direct line pedigree, my family tree, are 26. That's only about 21% of the 125, 126 people who I am descended from. So this is not easy. And that's part of the challenge here is it's you take it one step at a time. The interesting thing that I want you to see with this graphic down at the bottom, all of those people that are the black dots, those are people that I can identify. And those that are still pink and blue are those that I I, I may know names about, but I don't know much about them. So here's some interesting things that, um, I, you know, that I think are interesting about this slide is that if you look at that line that goes across, that's 1870. And 1870 is the first census in which African-Americans are listed. And so you can see the change that occurs just looking at your own uh, um, pedigree chart. The other thing that I wanna share with you, and if you have a pencil that you're making some notes with, is one of the things that you really need to have in your toolbox. And I'm sharing with you my toolbox. We're now in my garage and we're looking at my, my toolbox and the, the smorgasbord of all the things that I have here. One of those things is this research list. And a research list can be found in a lot of different places, but it, it's a reminder. It allows you again to check things off as you have uh, looked at them 
And it also helps you so that you don't duplicate. You can say that you've already looked at this particular document and you've already done certain things. And you can see here for this particular person, which is Margaret Syfax, this would be my second great grandmother. There is a lot of stuff that I have looked at, but maybe haven't been able to utilize, but I've checked off the things that I've actually been able to locate. So get a checklist, research checklist. African-American genealogy, it's not, it's not different than other genealogy. It just becomes different and more challenging because of the brick wall that we have in 1870. And that means that the way that we try to identify and find these folks that go you know, before 1870 becomes a little more of a challenge. And we have to use some techniques that will help us to kind of figure some of those things out. But we can do it. There's a wall, but we can get over it. One of the important things that I think you need to ask yourself as you're thinking about getting into this is, what is it that you wanna find? What, why are you doing the research? What is it that you're after? And there are a lot of things that could be a part of this. I'm doing it for several reasons, but here you can see there's you know, a pedigree chart. Do you wanna write a manuscript? A lot of people are writing books. Uh, you know, maybe it's just for the discovery. Maybe you just start interested in kind of how your family has, has you know, grown and changed and things. Maybe you wanna to put together a scrapbook or you have found a scrapbook and you wanna to try to make sense of that scrapbook. You wanna build a family tree, like the one that's down there at the bottom. That's our Syfax family tree that shows many, several different lines of, of family members. You know, people are doing genealogy now to understand their own health info in terms of you know, what kinds of things may have um, impacted their own health. And then there are also people looking for their birth family that may have been adopted, or for one reason or another, they have just lost track of people. So there are a number of different reasons of why you might search for these kinds of things. So where can you find information? Well, you can find information almost anywhere. And so I, I, I'm gonna use the next several slides to simply kind of, again, whet your appetite to think about where can I locate information about my ancestors? Well, clearly news clippings are an important part. You're gonna see this newspaper clipping again a little bit later on, but it's a fascinating one. When you see refuse to bribe a fortune, that, you know, that kind of gets your attention, doesn't it? So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. There's the family Bible. How many family Bibles have you seen where it lists all the births and the deaths and it talks about the weather and it talks about what was going on? Bibles are a wealth of information that should be uh, you know, at kind of at the top of the list and things that you might consider. Military records are huge in terms of understanding what our relatives uh, and our ancestors have uh, you know, been involved with. And here are two index cards for um, my Syfax ancestors, one of which on the left is for Douglas Syfax. He actually was a United States colored troop uh, in the infantry, and he was actually stationed over near Arlington, which is really pretty amazing. And over on the right is William T. Syfax, who actually was a Tuskegee Airman. So it's interesting to be able to put these pieces together and then try to piece together their lives. Start with what you have nearby. You know, there are a lot of things that are in, within your grasp today that could allow you to get started. There are pictures and photographs over there on the right, the, the woman in the back here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, this is my mother, Zipporah. And she uh, was the first African-American nurse to graduate from the University of Colorado in the early forties. Uh, and so this is a picture of her that I found in her hope chest, you know, in terms of the things that, that she has kept and that I've stumbled onto. There are letters and scrapbooks and newspaper clippings, as we talked about, some of which are challenging just to be able to read. You know, we have to be able to translate or transcribe information so that we can understand what was going on. And there are lots of clues to be found there. And then there's the family folklore and the vital records that we can get from others. Who amongst your family is holding that information? If there are seniors in your family, you should try to talk with them as soon as you can to try to get their perspective about their lives and what they can tell you, because they can be a wealth of information, as I'm sure you know. Funeral records and obituaries are important. Here's a, a obituary and a funeral program for my cousin, Mickey Syfax. He was a graduate of Howard University, and he became a real leader in this community and helped to lead Howard's uh, surgery department uh, for many, many years. And 
I've had people come up to me and say, I know Mickey Syfax. He actually operated on me. I mean, it, there's a lot of ties that really pull our family into our community and our society. And it's really neat to see how people, how this web is really uh, kind of um, goes over and over again in terms of how people are connected. I like to show this slide because I think it's really important as you're thinking about the search. You know, I, I titled this, What's in a Name? If you think about the name that we're talking about today, the Syfaxes, Syfaxes have been written a lot of different ways. I mean, they've got a name over there that's Lifax or Linux. You know, it's completely different than what we think about. Even though Syfax is a very unique name, it's been distorted in a number of ways that can make it a little bit difficult to find information. But you can see here, Mickey Syfax, the, the person that I was just speaking about, that was his nickname. Everybody knew Mickey. They didn't really know who Burke Syfax was, but they're one and the same. So when people think about Burke, um, they immediately think about Mickey. But if you didn't know that, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were the same person. There's below that is, some people would say that first name is Maria, but it's Mariah in the terms in, in, for one of the people in our family. So how names are spelled and how they pronounce are also part of family history that is important. Below that is William, William, William. I mean, you'll find you know, families that they stick with one name. And so trying to find one person from one generation to the next can be very complex and challenging. But you need to recognize that all of these things exist and you need to do your due diligence to be able to um, separate and delineate one person from another. Some people may drop with their last name. Peter Joseph was my uh, great grandfather. We'll talk about him more in a few minutes. But his father, at one time, we thought was named Narevich, uh, which is Austrian, uh, never really showed up in Peter Joseph's um, you know, uh, formal records. And so the loss of that last name can have some impact. And then down at the bottom, there are place names that have the same challenges. You've got Grand Echo versus Grand Encore. And the Grand Echo in this particular case was written in a document that I was uh, analyzing. And I realized that after doing a lot of research that it really wasn't Grand Echo, it was Grand Accor. This is down in uh, Louisiana. So it's important to think about the, just because you see a name, it may, may not be the actual name or there may be some, uh, uh, some changes that are associated with it. The other thing is cemetery records. You know, I've talked about burial records and, you know, um, um, obituaries and that kind of thing. But we, this is a screenshot of uh, those Syfaxes who I'm aware of that have been interred at the National Harmony Park Memorial Cemetery uh, over near the stadium, just outside of DC. And you can see a lot of Syfaxes here. And you, I also try to show their, uh, the maiden names. I also try to show where they're located. I try to show who they are descended from. And as you put these things together, they can be very helpful to try to tell stories and help to create the picture that you're looking for for your family. It's always interesting to me to be able to go in and see the original log. This particular log is for my second great grandfather, Peter Joseph in Denver, Colorado. And you'll see that the book is really old. They pulled this out of a large safe that's just, it's decrepit. And they have all of these books that are the original records. And you can barely read some of the names that are there, but the information is there. So this original uh, you know, primary source information is extremely important as you're trying to piece together your family history. So I wanna use the next several slides to kind of show, continue to show you um, you know, artifacts that I'm using and documents that I'm using, but I'm going to try to tie them to particular people in my, my, uh, fam, you know, my, uh, my pedigree. And so I'm going to first talk about William Syfax, who's my fourth great grandfather. He was born in Alexandria around 18 or 1773, and he was enslaved. What, here's what we know about him. Most of the stuff that I learned about him early on was really about was folklore. You know, there's one thing that said he came from Canada, that he was an itinerant preacher, that he lived at Mount Vernon and had children at Mount Vernon with, with enslaved women there, that he had a son, Charles, that, he, that Charles married the great granddaughter of Martha Washington. For me, this was like mind blowing. You know, this is fact and fiction and all of this kind of balled up together. And how do we pick this apart? 
Well, we need to start to think about what are the supporting documents that can help us start to pull this information together and corroborate the information that we've been told and start to question whether these things are realistic or perhaps they don't really line up. So there's, there's a considerable amount of analysis that has to go in this and questioning that has to go into this. And you can see over on the right a variety of things, including DNA, which we are doing with our, the work that we're doing to try to help us better understand what's going on with William Syphax here. So one of the things, I know this is a very, very busy uh, document, but what I wanted to just uh, uh, help you to see is that this is a, a pocket guide for me. One of the things that I like to do is I like to put together a timeline of a person's life. And I like to put together the things that I know uh, or, or the folklore that says that certain things happened. And by doing that, and by looking at other people they may have associated with, you can start to see a picture and to kind of confirm or question whether some of the information that you have is accurate. So you can see here, William Syfax is on, you know, on the left and highlighted, he's that green line. And you can see, I have him associated with uh, John Gadsby, below it, uh, George Washington and John Carlisle. And it basically shows all of his children being here. We have Nancy and Charles being born and we have a, a, the other children. And I find it really interesting to be able to pull that together, especially when I go to a library like this and we can then, it reminds me of things that um, I can be looking for. So one of the real, I, I'm gonna say this many times here in this conversation, but one of the things I really have uh, enjoyed and, and, and proud to find is William, Syfax's manumission document. This document was actually filed in uh, Alexandria in 1831, but it actually took place in 1817. It took 14 years for this document to actually be filed in the court. But what's great here is that William Syfax is actually being freed and we have four people, two people that were you know, the, the owners freeing him and two people who were basically attesting to the fact that this document is, is legitimate. Very, very amazing. But as you begin to look at this kind of document, you can see some certain things. I would like to point out here, we have Thomas Barocas was his owner and Samuel Wheeler was a partner of Barocas. But down here, we have a gentleman by the name of Edward Stapler. Edward Stapler owned the apothecary shop in Alexandria, Virginia. So I wanna to go to the next slide here and once William Syfax was freed, he continued to raise money so that he could free other members of his family. And in 1827 and 1837, he filed manumission documents freeing his then wife and several of his daughters. Unfortunately, my uh, third great grandmother, Nancy Syfax, who was also his daughter, was not freed in that, in, during that period. But it's interesting here to see when you look at documents like this, look who shows up. There's another stabler on here. So where did the sta their stablers and the Syfaxes must have had some interaction here more than once in terms of trying to you know, make lives different. And so finding documents like this are extremely exhilarating, but they're out there. Your, your relatives too, your ancestors too may be parts of these documents. The other thing that we can find is we can look at um, newspaper documents, and we can see here that William Syfax was thought to, he talks about how he, um, you know, how much he paid to free himself as well as his children. That to me is just incredible to be able to kind of put that information together. The next slide is one that really corroborates, or I would say indexes uh, the manumissions that took place. And I'll show you this in, in, in reality here when we talk uh, at the end of this presentation, but this is a register of freed Negroes uh, that really shows the registrations that, that occurred. The great thing about it is that these registrations usually have a description of the people who are being registered to be free. And so you can use these documents as you're finding your ancestors to learn a little bit more about what they looked like and you know, kind of where they were. The other thing about William Syfax that I want to share with you is this is the earliest census document that I have found for our family. It's an 1820 U.S. census for Alexandria, Virginia. And as I said before, 1870 is tough because you don't have 
people that were enslaved were just numbers. Well, this shows that William Syfax was actually free. Remember I mentioned that the manumission document was filed in 1817, this is 1820. So William Syfax actually shows up in the census in Alexandria. And the great thing about it is once again, we can look at the names around William Syfax and we can use that information to learn more about where William Syfax lived and what his lifestyle may have been like and what kinds of things he was having to overcome as a free black man walking around in Alexandria, Virginia. Another amazing document that I wanna share with you is a letter. This letter was written by William Stabler. Remember we talked about the Stablers who helped to free the, the Syfaxes? This document, this, this letter was sent by William Stabler in 1835. And he did this because William Syfax was, had gone north to try to raise money to free his family. And this Quaker basically sent a note to one of his friends to say, if you see William Stabler, tell him that his life may be in danger if he comes back here. How complex is that narrative in terms of thinking about how people's lives affect one another? Here's a person who kind of helped to free the Syfaxes, who cares enough about this person to send a letter to Philadelphia to try to get word out to uh, William that his life may be in danger. Amazing when you start to think about the fabric of a narrative. Okay, so I wanna keep moving on the family tree here. And I'm gonna talk about Nancy. This is my third great grandmother next. I'm gonna show you some different uh, documents here. The one that I like to show about Nancy the most is are these two documents. On the left-hand side is a petition that Augusta McBlair, her enslaver filed in 1862 when the Compensated Emancipation Act was uh, made law. And that law provided those people who were enslaved people that if once they were free, once the people of Washington DC who were enslaved were free, the enslavers were compensated. And so on the left-hand side is the petition that shows all the people that Augusta McBlair enslaved. And you can see number four there is Nancy. She basically claimed that Nancy was worth, she put a worth on Nancy of about $800. Over on the right-hand side is a document that shows what the commission that decided on how much people would get uh, shows that, that Augusta McClare got for Nancy. And if you look closely, you can see that Nancy was considered to be, had a value of $87.60. That to me, it's just absolutely incredible. And it makes me really think about uh, the challenges. Nancy became free, but Augusta McClare was freed was, was paid for her service. The interesting thing about this is that Nancy continued to remain in the Blair household. Here we have the 1860 census and the 1870 census. So remember the uh, Compensated Emancipation Act was uh, passed in 1862. So in 1860, the 1860 census, we see Augusta McBlair here but all of the people in the household who were enslaved, there are no names. I believe that this particular person here at the top is probably Nancy Syfax. It's pretty amazing. This is, this is the 1860 slave schedule. So it shows Augusta McBlair was the enslaver. And then it lists all of the people who were enslaved in her household. And this 66 year old lines up very closely with Nancy, you know, the, the dates, the, of, of age tend to vary a little bit, but it's very likely that this older woman here was probably Nancy. Then we go to the 1870 census and we see the, the McBlair household again. And who do we have here at age 79? Nancy Syfax. Amazing to see, but the interesting thing here is she's now free, but still in the household of the person who enslaved her. I also have this great letter that her grandson wrote to her, Nancy's grandson. It's a letter from Peter Joseph, who we'll talk about here in just a few minutes, to, Na to his granny, Nancy Syfax. And this, as we think about uh, the, the value of products and, and tools in your toolbox, letters are incredible. So this particular letter talks about where 
Peter Joseph is at. It talks about his age. It also talks about his siblings in terms of where they are and who they're, you know, how old they are and what their names are. So there's an incredible amount of information that can be mined from this kind of information. This is a document that is held by one of my cousins out in California, and we're just so proud to even have this in our archive. So the next group that I want to talk about is Charles and Mariah Syfax. These are my third great uncle and his wife. The chart that I want to show here, the family tree, is really very interesting. This is a product that was produced by the National Park Service. There's a lot of information about Mariah Syfax and Charles Syfax, and that's because they have connections to the first family of the United States. The interesting thing here is that Mariah was the daughter of George Washington Park Custis. And if you're not familiar with George Washington Park Custis, he basically had enslaved people build the mansion there that is at Arlington National Cemetery that overlooks the city. It's really very, it's a beautiful space. It's now operated and managed by the National Park Service. But George Washington Park Custis was the grandson of, of Martha Washington. The interesting thing about this story is that George Washington Park, I should say Mariah was born in 1803. George Washington Park Custis, her father marries in 1804 and has a daughter, Mary in 1808. So Mariah and Mary are half sisters. In 1821, Mariah marries Charles Syfax, who was also enslaved by George Washington Park Custis. They marry in the parlor of that mansion. In 1831, 10 years later, older sister or younger sister Mary marries Robert E. Lee. This is absolutely fascinating story in terms of these families being connected, but being on completely different trajectories. And the stories and the history that I hope to be able to bring to light really is important to try to pull these stories out as we try to learn uh, you know, about these, these folks. So the Syfaxes actually were, actually Mariah Syfax was actually given 17 acres of property at the south end of Arlington. A lot of people don't know that. There's a lot about, it's been written about that, but um, not, not a lot of people know that. So this particular uh, artifact, I, I want to show you, it, maps are incredible in terms of use for your family history. It helps put things into perspective in terms of timing and when things happen. And this particular map that I created you know, was kind of a, a mashup of a variety of different things, shows the Syfax property, it shows the Freedman's Village, it shows the Arlington House up here, and it also shows all of the military uh, uh, facilities and things that actually existed uh, that were built during the Civil War. There's a lot that I could talk about in this space, but we don't have time to do that today. But suffice it to say that maps like this can be very valuable as you think about telling your family. History. So the other thing I wanted to share with you today is this, uh, uh, you know, look a little more of a deep dive at the census. And, and it's a great way to do this because of the connections that we have with the Syfaxes at Arlington and the Lee family and other pieces. So when we're thinking about trying to find information about people, we start with the most recent census and we work backwards. So what I want to do here in the next several slides, is I want to work from the 1880 census and walk you backward in terms of some of the things that we are seeing here. So if we look at this 1880 census, there's a picture of the page and the yellow line there is actually Mariah Syfax. It shows her here and it shows all of her children down here. We go to the 1870 census, we can see the same thing. We can see Mariah here listed at the top as the head of the household. Uh, and we can all see all of the children that are listed here. And there are actually some grandchildren and some spouses. So that's 1870. Now we're back to 1860. Remember, we talked about 1860 being a difficult, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a wall in terms of, you know, kind of breaking through this wall. Uh, if we look at this particular document, we can see Mariah and we can see on the very next household, here we are. These are the household dwelling numbers. 1903 is the Syfaxes, and the one that's 1905, there's 1904 is in the middle. 1905 is the Robert E. Lee household. This is the mansion up on the top of the hill. So they're listed on the same page of the census as the Lee family. 
So we can see connections here. We can see how these families have changed over time in terms of marriages and, life and deaths. So the 1850 census is one that I think is very interesting to look at. This is, you can see Mariah Syfax over here. One of the things that's very important to do is to look at pages on either side of the one where you're a family member that you're interested in. And so on the previous page of the one from Mariah, we also have, we can also see some custises. And if we put this together, look what we have here. So this is why it's important to basically look at multiple pages as you're thinking about the census. Just because you find somebody on a particular page doesn't mean there won't be some very valuable information on the pages that precede or follow it. So it's important to look at that. Now, one of the questions that, that we need to ask is, so what happens to Charles? Charles was enslaved. Mariah was actually freed by her father uh, in 1825. And that's why she shows up here. So she, although she was enslaved at birth, her father freed her and therefore her children were free. But Charles remained an enslaved servant uh, of, of, of George Washington Park Custis. So where does where's William, show, William or Edward, excuse me, where does Charles show up? Well, if we look at the 1850 slave census, it may give us a couple of clues. So what we have here are two pages and these pages are the enslaved people, these columns, this one, this one, and this one are all of the enslaved people that were owned by George Washington Park Custis. So we can see here that there are, you know, the, the slave owners and we have, it's a table of, of, of all of their enslaved people, but there's no names. In this particular case, a quick analysis of this, you can see that I've broken it down. I've tried to, to um, identify the male and female and those by age. So we can kind of bracket them. We also know about the age of Charles. So we can basically look at this document and try and this is very, very likely why we don't have a hundred percent assurance. It's very, very likely that this particular entry is for my third great uncle, Charles Sidebeck. Okay, can we keep moving here? We're kind of getting short on time. We're gonna talk about Peter Joseph very, very quickly here. And then we're gonna show you a couple of items here in the library. I wanted to go back to the pocket guide here very quickly because again, it shows you how I am using it, not just for one person, but I'm using for all the people that I want to do a deep dive on. And this particular document shows a number of different things here. I wanna blow this up for just a second to show you that one of the things that I did here to try to give you a sense for and, and remind me of where things are happening at a certain time is, you know, I use stars here. These stars are when the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 occurred and, and uh, the uh, Compensated Emancipation Act in Washington, DC. Uh, this is the blue here is the Civil War. The yellow stars are basically the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments being passed. Um, and the uh, uh, yellow is, the or the orange is basically the uh, reconstruction as it's going on. And then all of the uh, letters here are uh, Peter Joseph's children being born. So it allows me to see all of these things kind of in one place and their reminders as I'm looking for information. Got to keep moving. So how do we know about Peter Joseph? One of my cousins in California has this a legal ledger that's several pages long, 65 pages long, and there have to be 600 or more um, newspaper articles that are in it about Peter Joseph. Absolutely incredible. And you too may have uh, some kind of documents like that in your, you know, in the back of the closet or in a box or, you know, or something. Search for those things. My uh, great grandfather, Peter Joseph, looked very European in his looks. Uh, interesting thing here, here's the, uh, okay, we're at three minutes. I'm going to keep moving here. The things that I want to show you here is there's information you can find at the National Archives. Peter Joseph actually was a presidential elector in 1876. I, that blew my mind when I was looking at this, but he was a presidential elector in 1876. And if you will Google uh, um, the 1876 election, you will find out that it's one of the most highly contested um, uh, presidential elections this country has ever had, and it, it threw our country into chaos for several months. And it was also the beginning of the end for Reconstruction. 
other information, court documents. Here's a court document that lists Peter Joseph as the plaintiff and the appellate for, you know, he basically uh, 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 filed a lawsuit for discrimination. You saw how his, how European he looked in terms of white and color, but he was, he felt discriminated against when he went to a theater and he filed uh, a lawsuit and he actually won in the Louisiana Supreme Court. One of the first uh, um, uh, lawsuits after the 14th Amendment. Here's a document I'm extremely proud of. I keep saying this over the things that you find, but I'm extremely proud of this particular document and reading this. I get choked up when I talk about it. It, it, it's a document that uh, uh, a newspaper article about Peter Joseph and his family and how they contributed to the monetary fund that was going to be used to fight, uh, you know, pay for the cost of the Plessy versus Ferguson case. Absolutely incredible. And down at the bottom, it talks about uh, Peter Joseph and his perspective. And it basically says, how many other fathers of family will emulate an example so calculated to inspire the children with patriotism and fill them as they grow up with the spirit of resistance to oppression. Oh my gosh, I, I, just, I just love that. But you too probably have documents that will, that will move you like this one has moved me. Uh, uh, city directories, you can find those in almost any city library. They go back many, many years. Uh, we're talking about Peter Joseph and, and the fact that he, after the Civil War, he actually began to put together uh, Black um, militias to try to protect the Black people of New Orleans against the oppression that was occurring there. And I'll show you a couple more things here. So timelines. I, lo I love this because if you look at all of those sword uh, uh, city directives, you can actually put together a timeline. And this red um, arrow here shows Peter Joseph. Uh, in 1876, which is the one that I showed just a couple of slides ago, and you can bracket that with all the other things. And from that information, uh, I'm going to keep moving here. From that information, you can actually create a map that will show where Peter Joseph lived over the course of 20 or 30 years. Okay, so we're almost, we're almost out of time. The last thing I wanna show here is this uh, application for military pension. And the important thing about this that I want you to see is there's a tremendous amount of information here. On number five, it says, were you a slave? And the answer that my second great grandfather or my great grandfather basically left there, when a child, my father purchased my freedom from Miss Mice Corn France. Impactful and it also provides a great deal of information. So with that, I think we will transition here. There's a lot of good things. And I, this is the last thing I'll show you. And this is something we're gonna look at in just a second. It is actually a lithograph that shows the inaugural parade of Benjamin Harrison. And this was in 1888. And Peter Joseph actually led a battalion of black militia members in this parade. So I'm really proud of that. And it's interesting to be able to find that information right here. Okay, I hope you can see me. Uh, we were just looking at that lithograph from the uh, Benjamin Harrison inaugural parade. And what you will see here is that document. I was able to make a copy of that for you know, my own purposes. And so I can use to show people like you are interested in trying to find these things. And so, the History Center has a tremendous number of lithographs and pictures and things that you can find here. The next thing that I would like to show you is actually a copy of, this is the original copy of the um, document that was created by the Commission for the Compensated Emancipation Act. And the arrow there shows the actual payment this is number 307, it's Augusta McBlair, and it shows the list of people that she had petitioned to be repaid for. And you'll see that the fourth one down, I know it's hard to see, but the fourth one down is Nancy Syfax, $87.60. This is a copy, or this is where I basically pulled my information from as I shared with you. So you can find that information here and you too may have ancestors who are listed in this document. The next document that I want to share as we move quickly down the list here is a document that, that's titled Washington in the New Era, 1870 to 1970. 
And interestingly enough, it actually shows William Syfax on one of the pages. And he played a huge role in education here in the city. I won't go into details here, but he was the first black um, head of the black public schools here in Washington, DC. And there's actually a school, um, William Syfax, Syfax School in Southeast that was named after him, after his death. So documents like this can be very helpful as you're trying to learn more about our history in a, in a certain area. The next documents that I wanna share with you are those abstracts and indexes that I talked about earlier. These are both written by Dorothy Provine. This document here is actually a copy of the document that I pulled information from in the slides that I showed you. So I just really quickly wanna to try to show you in the back here, you can see the list of all the Syfaxes. And then you can find in the body of the document information about everyone that's listed there. So here's Sally Syfax, and it talks about Sally being five feet, one and a quarter inches tall, has dark complexion. And so you can learn more about all of these folks. And Dorothy Crowvine has done a tremendous amount of work in terms of making it easier for you and me to find information. The last things that I wanna show you are really a pretty special find for me. I didn't know they were here until I began to come and, and look, look for things and I didn't know they existed. But when I began to look for Syfax related items, I found these portraits. The top portrait is one of Mariah Syfax. This is the granddaughter of George Washington excuse me, the daughter of George Washington Park Custis. And that would be the great granddaughter, excuse me, the great great granddaughter of Martha Washington. Amazing that we have a photograph that's one of the originals that uh, were taken of her. And then down below that is Mariah's son, William Syfax, who again was the head of the, the colored schools here in uh, Washington in the 1870s. And it's a beautiful photograph of him. So there are a lot of things that you can find. You know, here's, here's the, the, the folder where we got that information from. I would say, come down here. You'll have a chance to become more aware of the kinds of information that are here. And, it, and you have to be patient as you're looking for information. So with that, we will transition back and I'll hand it back over to you, Anne. Wow, Steve, that was amazing um, and an incredible plethora of information um, that you shared with us. So thank you so much. And thanks for showing a glimpse of the library itself. Um, I'm actually in the office space just right around the corner from the Kiplinger Research Library. I'm jealous you get to be in there. Um, but for those um, for whom coming into the library isn't as much of an option, because I see in our chat, we have folks chiming in from Dublin and from Germany and from California. Um, and then of course, um, uh, elsewhere in the United States, as well as locals, we have this lib guide, this resource guide um, that I just wanted to sort of orient you to. All of the links that we have put in the chat today um, that Steve has referenced, plus many, many more um, are collated here or will be collated here in this, what, we're, what we call the researching family history guide. Now, this particular guide was created by my colleague, Research Services Librarian Kimmy Ramnine, and it is a living document. So it's a place to collate resources and add new ones as they come to our attention. So during a program like this, if somebody shares in the Q&A a link to a resource that would help other researchers do family history, um, particularly related to the DC region, we would be happy to add those links to this guide. Um, it's, a, it's a really um, wonderful place to bring all sort of all the resources together. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly um, go over the way the document is organized. Okay, so um, in the section, the types of resources available um, these will, um, if you click on the blue links on the left, and again, the, the link to this guide has been put in the Q&A in a few places, and we'll, we'll drop it back again. Um, then the guide expands, and you would see all the different sorts of uh, census records or city directories, telephone records, how to access that information, both 
in person here at the Kiplinger Research Library, um, as well as online. Um, we have a great, um, lots of great folks chiming in in the Q&A offering resources such as Betty Ann Kane, who notes that the Library of Congress, among other uh, repositories, have put these city directories online. Um, it would also go over how newspapers, vital records, and um, other DC government records can be helpful in your family history research. The other way the guide is organized, and we'll just head on over to the next slide, is by DC History Center specific resources. And among these resources, we've identified family papers that we hold here that may be of interest for you as you do your family history research. And we have um, identified enslavement and emancipation records as well. Now in the chat link, we did list to a very new to us resource, um, which is a spreadsheet created by um, Gretchen Robert, uh, Robert Shorter uh, in 2013, that is a, a really wonderful tool for making um, quick use actually, and, and being able to really research uh, among the petitions relating to compensated emancipation. So I just wanted to flag that resource in particular. Um, but again, the LibGuide is there, it is online, it is um, a, a living document that we are constantly adding resources to. So if we did not mention a resource that you have found helpful in your DC history, um, DC family uh, research, um, we would love for you to share that either in the, the Q&A today, or you can always research, 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 <laughs> reach us here in the library at library at dchistory.org. Um, and so again, uh, please do check that link out and let us know um, if there are other resources we should add. But with um, with that having um, been uh, explained in about uh, a minute or less, what I'd love to do now is actually invite uh, Linda and Steve to join us um, on camera. Thank you. Hi, Linda. Hi, Steve. Um, what we're going to do now, we only have a few minutes, but I do want to address some of the questions that have come up in the chat. Um, and uh, see what we can uh, address um, uh, verbally. And of course, we did answer about 40 questions in the Q&A. Thanks so much, Linda, for all of the, your great work um, in doing that. Um, the first thing I want to pose is actually, um, uh, it's a question of my own, and I hope that's okay, but you two are officers of a genealogical uh, organization. And I'm wondering if you can just tell everybody a bit about AUGS. Why don't you do that, Linda? Okay, thanks, Steve. So I am the president of the DC chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. It is a national organization and there are chapters in many cities in Virginia. There's at least three chapters in Maryland, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, um, Howard County. We all collaborate on a lot of different things, but most of us have monthly meetings and sometimes more in between where experts like Steve, for instance, would talk about their own family history um, or some special topic like using Google in your family research. I mean, that's a legitimate you know, thing. Um, or they talk about free Negroes. And AUGS has a conference coming up in October. We have a conference every October. Everyone is welcome to register. So Linda, actually, thank you so much for telling us so much about AUGS. I am going to um, pull us back to the Q&A um, to address some of the questions that have been posed by our audience. So this one is for you, Steve. Um, did you find records identifying the religious affiliations of the SIFAX? And if so, what affiliation? And sort of as a corollary to how this would, would um, sort of help other people in the research, how can religious affiliation help identify a particular branch of a family and make sure it's the, the branch of the family you're looking for? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, the uh, the fact that the uh, Syfaxes were were married, Mariah and Charles were married at the um, Arlington House. Um, you know, the, the history that we have here is that they were married by an Episcopal minister. Uh, I, I don't believe that that's necessarily how they practiced. And at that particular time, this is in 1821, uh, uh, you know, a lot of those records, you know, the, the facts that, that, that people were uh, um, uh, worshiping in certain areas and they wanted to get married, they, they weren't seen as legitimate. And so that makes it kind of a challenge in places. But we do know that here in Washington, D.C., the Syfax was associated with Baptist churches. Um, my, I, I'm, I'm convinced that, uh, um, you know, my uh, third great grandmother, Nancy, who was enslaved at uh, uh, Decatur House and by the McBlairs, that she in this urban setting had the ability to go to church. 
and, and, and to attend churches in other places. And I think that she was probably Baptist as well. And so I continue to use that information to try to figure out you know, where the cemeteries were that might allow me to learn more about Nancy's life. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there, there are logs and registers that churches have, you know, a lot of them, you know, go back many years and a lot of them no longer exist. So that information is out there. You just have to be diligent and willing to kind of, you know, look through the haystack. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so you might have had a little bit of a leg up, uh, one of our audience members feels, by having um, an unusual yeah. last name, Syfax, yeah. right? So it's a unique name, as Jessica writes. Uh, are there any tips for researching the many John Smiths and Henry Jacksons of the world? Sometimes it is hard to tell who they are as you follow them through the years in the censuses. So any tips on that front? Good luck. <laughs> no, no. It so the, the challenge really becomes, you know, as we think about, you know, I, I talked about what's in a name and we talk about the Williams, you know, they have several Williams and they're, they're kind of their, 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 their given name and not their surname, but it's the same situation as how do you pick these apart? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of Smiths out there and you basically start at the top and work your way through. And the key is trying to find corroborating evidence that allows you to point to the particular person that you're interested in. It's not easy and it takes patience, but there are trails out there for all of those Smiths that you're looking for. Great. Um, so here we have a question about um, a particular type of resource. It's the, um, uh, the, the audience member is wondering if you used in your research the 1868 voter registration which is the abstract of voter registrations reported to the military government. Um, and if so, did you find family members in those documents? I actually have not used that registration guide, so I'm not you know, able to talk about that today. I don't know, Linda, if you're familiar with that document or not, but. I am not, but there are so many documents. Again, look at the lib guides here at the DC History Center. I was looking at that yesterday. I've looked at it before, but I always see things different. I, we have to revisit um resources and repositories because our heads are at different places at different times new information is always being revealed mm -hmm. so does that answer uh, your question <laughs> I, I would i would just say that 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 would be a very valuable piece again to corroborate other information so definitely mm -hmm. you got you got to dig into it and you know a lot of the work that i have done in libraries like this one is to come here initially and just get a sense for what's here Mm -hmm. you know, just so you kind of have a feel for it. So it takes more than one trip to get what you're looking for. So to try to come down and get an orientation on the kinds of things that you can find, and then use that next trip as you start to put together your questions, then the, the reference librarians can help you pull things before you get here so that you can start to look at things and make your time more efficient. Uh, well, while I wish we could get to everybody's questions, I cannot think of a better way to start wrapping up this program than what Steve just said. Um, I, I really hope that the questions we have covered have led to a better understanding of family history research, or maybe through the chat, I saw so many wonderful, great exchanges in the, the Q&A. Um, so maybe you've met somebody to learn something more from today, either on screen or, or in the chat. Um, and that's so much of what it makes genealogical research fulfilling, you know, meeting new people making new connections, uh, just like Linda introduced us at the DC History Center to so Stephen. Um, so with that, I wanted to say thank you again to Stephen Hammond for leading today's orientation and to Linda Critchlow White for joining us. We are so grateful to you both. Um, if you're ready to take on your own research, we hope that you'll come visit us um, here uh, at the Kiplinger Research Library. Um, you can visit our exhibits or you can visit our store as well and purchase some genealogical material in that store. Um, and I want to say thanks to everybody in the Q&A who dropped links, shared questions, um, offered comments on other people's questions. Um, this sort of community is really invaluable and um, we're really, really grateful for it. Um, the best way to keep tabs on programs of interest is to sign up for our newsletter. With that, have a fabulous rest of your day. <laughs>